So thank you so much for joining us today. I am the Chief of Staff and uh, Director of Operations in the School of Public Health um, and have been working with the UMD Cross Campus Civic Engagement Working Group. Uh, and we have joined with sponsors from multiple colleges and schools across the university, the College of Education, the School of Public Health, the School of Public Policy, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the University Chaplains. I welcome everyone to this important panel conversation where we're honoring the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Today, our cross-disciplinary panel is going to discuss the impact of 9-11 attacks and link our knowledge and our understanding to present day events. Our panelists are going to reflect on this historical event and re-engage within the current context of identity-based geopolitical issues, including the murders of George Floyd and Black Lives Matters, the COVID-19 pandemic, the war in Afghanistan, and the U.S. withdrawal after 20 years. They'll also be emphasizing the importance of the legacy of service that came out of this significant time of loss and change for the U.S. and the world. As we're marking this date, we're highlighting the legislative establishment of the September 11th National Day of Service and Remembrance that friends and family members championed to honor the people who lost their lives. We're calling for a recommitment to a lifetime of military, national, and public service, volunteerism, and civic engagement. I'm really pleased to honor our moderator for today, Dana Priest. She's a two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter, best-selling author, and Knight Chair in Public Affairs Journalism. Dana Priest moderates this important 9-11 then and now renewing a commitment to service, volunteerism, and civic engagement panel conversation, bringing 30 years as a Washington Post investigative reporter, covering the Pentagon, intelligence agencies, Russian disinformation operations, and veteran issues. Welcome, Dana. One of the things that Dana mentioned that she was curious about today is reflecting on um, our, the panelists' own memories of the day of 9-11-2001. And um, perhaps some of you could reflect on that now. Um, Mary, maybe I'll start with you. No, so thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, thank you to the University of Maryland. Thank you, Dana, your absence. I look forward to, to talking to you as soon as you hop back on. Um, I was a junior, a cadet, at the United States Military Academy at West Point on 9-11. And I can distinctly remember um, rushing up to the top of my barracks room and seeing the, the black smoke billowing from, from the city. Uh, West Point is about 90 miles away from uh, downtown New York City. Um, and that evening, all of my class was pulled into an auditorium um, after being told to change from our tra traditional uniforms into battle dress uniform or the camouflage uniform that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And we were told in no uncertain terms that when we graduated from West Point, we would be going into war. And sure enough, six months to the day after I graduated, I was leading a platoon of 50 men in a field artillery unit in Baghdad, Iraq. Um, so that day is the day that literally changed my life. Um, it is the day that marked uh, my, you know, my transition from uh, a college student at a leadership academy to a leader of our nation's sons and daughters. And it is literally the, the mark on the, on the wall of my life um, in, terms, in terms of service. So um, not only did I serve for those who we lost um, on that day, but every single year in the 20 years since, my life has been a tribute to those who we continue to lose. So I can't um, tire of this memorial or this, or this day because it uh, is a reminder of those lives that we lost, those heroes who rushed into those buildings on the, and the day and never came out, and those servicemen and women who still continue to serve to this day. Thank you for allowing me to, to share a little bit of that. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I think I'm going to ask um, Dean Lushniak to speak um, next um, with an additional perspective of service related to the, to the events of 
And then I will go back and if, if um, Dana has not been able to join us, I'll go back and introduce you all. So we're, we're working away a little bit backwards here, but um, Dean Lushniak, could you share a few words? Please? Great, thank you, Aaron. And thank you for the organizers of this event. Uh, I'll start off with a reflection of where I was 20 years ago tomorrow uh, and where I was in the subsequent few days uh, of that event. Uh, I was uh, then an officer in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, one of now the eight uniformed services. And the mission of the Commission Corps of the Public Health Service is to protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of our nation. Uh, at that time, uh, 20 years ago, we were a much different uniform service. And in essence, much like Mary talked about sort of this idea of how life changed it changed not only for me personally, but for my uniform service after that event. I was assigned to the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, to their National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. So I was uh, in stationed in Cincinnati, Ohio. That morning, I still remember as if it occurred almost yesterday, many of us who had lived through that do. Uh, my secretary, my administrative assistant in the office uh, for our team said, oh, an airplane crashed into the, the, the one of the Twin Towers. I was or was a, a, a airplane or a pilot at that point, uh, knew about airplanes, small planes, and I thought, boy, somebody must have really blown it and the weather must be bad in New York for an airplane. My assumption was it was a small plane that lost its way and what a terrible occurrence. Obviously, as things uh, and, and further information came in, we all know what that initial assumption was to minimize the event. Oh, it's something small. And then certainly in the subsequent few hours to see how incredibly devastating it was. Within a few days, we were deployed to the World Trade Center site uh, to work on occupational and environmental health issues to try to protect the rescue and recovery workers. So from the third day on, I was there, as they describe it at that point, on the pile working 12 hour shifts for the next several weeks. Uh, and, you know, going back to sort of the subsequent question that you brought up, it really did instill uh, that sense of, of, first of all, you know, for, for people who hadn't lived through this event, there was a very strange sense of unity in this country afterwards, something perhaps that we've not seen since. Uh, and it was unity and rage against and now fill in the blank, you know, uh, unfortunately, there were negative aspects to it, right, it became and the imam perhaps will reflect on this, it, it, it became a rage against those different from us. And, and that included the, the, the world of, of the Muslim world and, and the Arab world. Well, that was the negative aspect. The unity was for us to fight, right, something that had hurt us. Uh, and, and I then reflected on the fact that the subsequent 20 plus years of my career or 15 plus years when I wore the uniform of the public health service really did change to this service orientation more so than before and to this idea of being ready for any crisis and whether it was subsequent to that Hurricane Katrina, whether it was subsequent to that the H1N1 pandemic, whether it was the Ebola outbreak or now the COVID outbreak, that whole sense of, of us being ready to respond really was a transition point. Uh, and and it, it wasn't just people wearing the uniform like Mary and I, it was for many others, was a sense of, of a service dedication. Is there something bigger that we can actually unify around? And, and that perhaps was one of the, if there was such a thing as a positive repercussion, it was that sense of at least some time period of unity, whether we've lost it or not over these 20 years is now something that we can certainly discuss. Thank you, Aaron. So I'm back uh, and wanted to pick up with, um, you know, there's some, with a question for all of you. Uh, there's so many things we could, we could talk about today, um, but we wanna concentrate here on Congress's uh, remembering 9-11 by legislating the National Day of Service and Remembrance, which honors those that lost their lives, but also calls for a commitment to a lifetime of public service, which all of you uh, are certainly wonderful symbols of. Um, so I guess I'd like to start off by saying, by asking, how did the, how did 9-11, uh, and then also introduce all of you, but how did 9-11 change the trajectory of your own careers. Uh, and we are joined today by uh, Georgina Dodge, who's the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion here at the University. 
uh, Mary Tobin, um, who is the Senior Advisor for Wounded Warrior Veteran and Military Families Initiative at, uh, at AmeriCorps. Imam Taref Sharaim, who is the Muslim Chaplain at the University. Uh, Dean Robert Orr, who's the Dean of the School of Public uh, Policy. And Boris Luchniak, who's the, de is the Dean of the School of Public Health. And as we heard, was part of the CDC's response to, um, to Ground Zero. And thank you for that, um, for that memory. We, we all have, uh, I still have very clear memories. I'm sure that you, you all do too. But if we could start, um, Georgina, with you, uh, how did 9-11 change the trajectory of your, of your life or your career, however you wanna parse that? Sure, thanks, Dana. Hello, everyone. 9-11 changed the trajectory of my life, both personally and professionally. Um, professionally, I had just recently moved from a faculty position in an English department um, to become the director of an African-American community center that was part of the university. And at the center, we served a large immigrant population from Somalia. Um, and we partnered with city officials to help meet the increased need for support after not immediately in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. And what I what struck me and what sticks with me to this day is the fear that existed among a largely Islamic community. It was palpable. And for those of us working with the community, it was, it was simultaneously heartbreaking and frustrating that we could not promise them safety from our own fellow Americans. And when you think about the trauma that forces immigrants to leave their country and the trauma of their journeys and arrival, this was all compounded in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. And so for me, this really underlined the importance of the work that I do in real time and with real lives. And the personal impact, I lost friendships with some of my fellow veterans um, who had, and, and a family member, I should add, who had very different opinions um, from mine um, and whose need for retribution really overpowered um, their sense of humanity. And while you know, 9-11, the tragedy of 9-11 is certainly not the societal catalyst um, for those attitudes. We have to go really far back in, history, in human history as well as very deep into the human psyche to account for that. There are ways in which American identity and specifically polarity to this day was impacted by the events of 9-11 that still reverberates. I just ask you a quick follow up um, about the Afghan refugees who are coming now. Do you feel any difference? Uh, do you feel like the country is greeting them differently than they did the Somali refugees? Oh, absolutely. They are, yes. I think that we feel a sort of sense of paternity, I think for lack of a better word, towards Afghan and the Afghanistan ref refugees that has not existed with any other immigrant population, to be quite honest with you. Um, I think that even at the end of the Vietnam War, there was not this same sense of paternity, of sort of ownership, um, of, of sort of shared experience. And while I'm happy that Americans are supporting the Afghanistan refugees, um, it, it, is, it, it is a bit frustrating that that same show of support has not been there for other populations, much less for populations that have been in this country for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Imam uh, Shreem, what about you? Can you, um, can you identify how 9-11 changed your tra trajectory and also maybe speak about, you know, speak to students about that and, and <clears throat> remembering back when you were a student? <laughs> sure, sure. Well, first, uh, greetings of peace uh, to everyone and really from the heart, uh, thank you so much to the organizers for this incredible, incredible opportunity to have a conversation and, and engage in uh, some reflection. I, I pray that we're all coming with, you know, wholeheartedness here and, and an intention for 
hopefully, you know, healing and growing together. Uh, so, um, yeah, so so many visceral memories and feelings that are that are still that I still feel to this day. Um, you know, I remember I had just graduated uh, from the University of Maryland, so I'm, I'm ancient. Yes, I've been <laughs> been. Around. So it's interesting. I'm a chaplain. I I graduated from Maryland, and I I'm I'm attending to students that could be my children now. It's like it's an odd feeling because they were they were yeah they were not on Earth at the time. Uh, when I was at Maryland at the end of the 90s. So I had just graduated. Uh, I, my professional career was in technology and in science. So I, I, I took on a, a position at NASA Goddard, which is just 15 minutes away from campus, while still, uh, you know, staying engaged with my, you know, the student community, the Muslim student community on campus, just because I felt an affinity to them. I wasn't yet, a, you know, formally a chaplain, Muslim chaplain on campus. But I remember very well, here I was, um, we're, we're immersed in our work on, on, on a satellite mission and um, running my analysis. I'll never forget that phone call from my sister. Uh, and I'll never forget the horror I, I sensed, I, I heard in her voice, the shock, when she told me Tarif had been attacked. I didn't even know how to, you know, what to, you know, I didn't know how to make sense of what she was saying. Uh, she was disoriented, you could tell, and she said, you need to come home. Um, so I, I, I was trying to, again, gather the pieces and understand what was going on. And surely, um, the story started coming together that, you know, we were, we were attacked and the towers were falling. And our worst fears started surfacing right away, my own fear. I, I'll never forget when I ran out of my office and I just drove home, drove home to be with my parents, with my sister. And we huddled together, and, and I'll never forget the mm. overwhelming sensation of fear, grief, trauma, uh, you know, feeling that shock for the loss of human life. Our country has gotten attacked, uh, but also that incredible, profound sense of fear for what, for what was coming. Uh, for us, you know, being assigned that collective guilt. Yes, it was real, because we had already experienced that. It was there. It wasn't a new thing. It wasn't just a backlash that we were fearing the climate was already in place for all of this. And we we're concerned, so worried for our siblings, our children, our parents, for the amplification and the intensification of that climate of fear, of, of xenophobia, of, of racism, but also of attacks, physical attacks um, on our bodies, you know, also. While carrying all that also profound, you know, grief and deep, deep uh, sadness for what was happening to us as a country, as, as human beings. Uh, so all of that was happening in the moment, and in, indeed, we, you know, that disorienting also feeling of what was coming, that life is not going to be the same, started materializing in no time. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel on a personal level, you know, we could talk so much about what fear does to you, what trauma does to you. Um, it, with time, we started recognizing that I, I as a person, as a Muslim, as, as a son to my parents, but also as a future father, as a future husband, I had a choice of either remaining invisible, staying in the comfort of my home, so that you're not seen, uh, you're not recognized for, you know, by your skin color or your Islamic identity, um, your color identity, your, your, your ethnic origin, your name even, that, that instantly associates you with that. There was that tremendous fear and the question of, should I stay, should we stay home? Or should we actually also make the choice of coming out, right? And I'll never forget having to go to, to our, my own mosque and even at the University of Maryland gathering with our student community. And I'll never forget also the administration uh, reaching out instantly within 24 hours to say, come and let's gather. And we gathered in the STEM Student Union and really prayed together and we said, don't fear. And it was a powerful uh, message that really reassured and calmed the, 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 the fears. However, with time, we started, as I said, seeing the reality manifest the really uh, terrible, as I said, intensification of, of, of racism, of physical harm. I remember myself, I was driving not, not long after, after that in Connecticut with my family and somebody saw the hijab, the, the headdress of my sister, and started chasing us and wanted to run us off the road while, you know, uh, hurling at us uh, ethnic slurs and gestures that were really obscene. So 
people got killed. I remember also not too long after that I had to support our student community when they heard of their friends in North Carolina, uh, Dia user bright students who um, were essentially assaulted by their neighbor who barged into their home and, and executed them point blank. Uh, with a third member of the family, this same person who is also like posting anti-Islamic messages on Facebook. So it wasn't just uh, an imaginary fear, it became lethal and we had to uh, like step up, so to speak, to really be there for, to not only support our community, uh, but also to really affirm our story. So I feel like that there's a lot of changes that have happened in terms of the evolution of my role and understanding that I, I had to also make a choice of stepping out to affirm that identity, that story for my own children, my own family, but also for the sake of America, because there were implications in who we were becoming. And the show of solidarity that came out really spoke to, you know, the beauty of the opportunities that we had, the, the beauty, the good that's st that was still there. And that really, uh, as I said, shaped the journey from that point on. I, you know, we can reflect a lot more, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop here for the sake of uh, hearing from others as well. Well, I'd like to ask you a follow-up about the, um, the atmosphere for Muslim students today at the university and, and what, and what could non-Muslim students do or not do uh, to make that better? If it needs to be made better, I, I, do, I just don't know. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that, that's a really very important question of, you know, students collectively, they were, they don't have direct experience with 911, but we recognize that we're born into a very complex world um, where they have to inherit the impact, the effects of, of, of that tragic event and how it manifested in, in terms of the climate. Um, and again, there are so many conversations on, 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 on how we relate to each other as human beings and how we perceive the other, so to speak. There's no doubt that there's alienation among students. Um, alienation generally just from each other. Social media has been contributing to this. I'm sure, you know, boys, you, you know, you study in school public health, all the impact on mental health. Mental health is already damaged. It's, it's like we see a, a spike, a tremendous spike on the, well, you know, the, the, the damaging effects of our contemporary society uh, on, the, on the mental health and emotional well-being of students. But also, like you know, in terms of directly 911 and the general just climate of xenophobia of, of bigotry, it does affect deepen that sense of alienation. But I've also seen many students, honestly, you know, possessing more courage than we um, we assume they have. Um, really, they're they're really not afraid to affirm their story. Yes, they carry fears. Yes, they understand what's happened. But I would say that the the more that we um, remind each other, remind them of, of the need to come out and honestly affirm their story and identity and for others to widen the scope, widen the space, to hear the story of others, to hear the story of not only just Muslim students, but also every other community, every other uh, group that is marginalized, but also you know the individual and the collective stories. Because I think as people are allowed, they're given space for their moral imagination, but also for them to affirm their identity and story of that fear, talk about authentic healing being, you know, something that we can realize and, 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 and also to see the possibility for connection. Because at the end of the day, we're, we're all the same. And I would say that the aches and the pains that we're feeling, honestly, um, at, 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 the bar, at, the, at the end of the day, they really remind us that we're all human beings. They were all like at heart the same. And that we might have needed that pain to connect with each other and start to listen more authentically. So I would say that that's a level of thing that I would say Muslim students need to be humanized, to be seen as not just the, not the other, that they belong. Um, and, 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 you know, acts of solidarity and compassion and understanding are really powerful, in a, you know, when done in an authentic way. But also, we carry the same responsibility for also you know, understanding also the perspective of others and so forth. So that's, you know, uh, what okay. I would thank you, thank you. Sure. Uh, both of our deans lead schools that are at the epicenter of making the world a better place. So I'll start with Dean Orr. Um, did it change the tra trajectory of your of your career? And and also, I guess, um, how do you see the students in your school responding to the world that we left them <laughs> after nine eleven? Thank you, Dana. Um, without a doubt, 
9-11 did, excuse me, <clears throat> did change me personally um, and professionally, uh, largely because it changed my country and my profession overnight. Uh, public policy making, um, really, you can uh, identify a pre 9 11 and a post 9 11 era in policy making. The war on terror rubric changed foreign policy uh, making in the United States as well as foreign policy. I was five years out of graduate school, had spent a heady few years in the White House at the National Security Council and the State Department. Um, on 9-11, I was on my way to work at the Center for Strategic and International Studies on K Street. Um, the first plane went into the first tower while I was in the metro. And when I came out of the metro and went up into my building and saw it on TV, uh, my colleagues at a, a think tank, um, very internationally educated people uh, were totally confused by what they were seeing and were, um, you know, bemoaning the fact that, you know, this pilot could have accidentally hit this tower. And I remember an overwhelming sense of failure. Um, I had worked in, in the multilateral affairs office in the White House that had pictures of Osama bin Laden on the walls um, years before this happened. Um, I was part of a very small group of policymakers that knew that there were groups that wanted to hurt the United States, that believed things, that wanted to do as much damage to the United States as possible. So when I saw what had happened, I knew immediately that this was a terrorist attack. And on TV and my colleagues around me, everyone was wondering how this could have happened after the first plane. And it wasn't until the second plane and the third that, that people started to understand what this was. But that sense of failure that I was part of a, a very small elite that knew that this stuff was out there and that we had not prepared our country for it and had not prepared our citizens to understand what was happening out there. And that yes, some people did hate and fear the United States and that they were would try to do us damage. So that sense of failure um, uh, really motivated me um, uh, that, that we policymakers and people in kind of elite professions like foreign policy making have to get much better at connecting to um, our citizens. Um, they, the, the two way traffic of we understanding what their concerns are, but that was also them understanding what we get to see by having the privilege of being in senior policy making roles. Um, one, one thing is you asked about the, how today's students, what, what they've inherited um, this war on terror rubric that they've grown up in has changed the world in ways that they don't know that it's changed, but they do know what this world is like. We live in a hardened country. They talked about hardening the infrastructure, but we hardened our policy. We hardened our hearts. Um, we hardened. That was our response to 9-11. We militarized our foreign policy. We militarized our border. We militarized... Uh, our policing in this country, um, that is a direct result of 9-11 and the fear and the sense of us and them. Uh, and I think growing up in a hardened country um, is, is something, the burden that our students today bear, whether they know that it comes from 9-11 or not. I think the the response to 9-11 that I was looking for and that I have sought to, to cultivate throughout my career since 9-11 is that we need to deepen, not just harden. It is true that we had to harden some of our, our infrastructure and our approaches to uh, extremist ideologies, but the fact is we didn't deepen our what is best about America simultaneously. 
Um, we had the sympathy of the world and we squandered it. Uh, we became very separate from the world and seen as separate. So our, our American tradition of exceptionalism went from, I think, being a positive thing that we had a specific history and that we represented democracy and inclusion in a way. But that sense of exceptionalism was overtaken by an, an arrogant sense of exceptionalism. Uh, I went to work at the United Nations after this because I felt like um, the world needed to understand the US better and the US needed to understand the world better. Um, and I think it's that deepening of, um, of what is America um, and exactly what we're talking about today, our, our democracy, our sense of volunteerism, our sense of um, uh, brotherly and sisterly love that I think um, was much stronger and coherent, um, ironically, before 9-11. And that unity after 9-11 was more fear and anger based than it was drawing on our deepest traditions in this country. So uh, that's really what I think our students today um, are working on. They are deepening our American, uh, what it means to be American. And I love the fact that we're emphasizing the diversity, equity and inclusion element of our response to 9-11 because 9-11 fractured us in ways that are still painful and with us today. Um, and I think um, really e pluribus unum uh, from many one is something that the United States was founded on and it is uh, something that we have to all work on today. And I, I'm happy to say, I think our students are, are leading the way on that. And is the, has your school in particular changed its curriculum or emphasis at all in order to do exactly what you're saying? Yes. Um, in fact, uh, if you, you look at the early days of the School of Public Policy, we cranked out uh, an incredible number of uh, uh, and caliber of uh, national security focused students. The current Deputy Secretary of Defense, the first woman Deputy Secretary of Defense is a graduate of our school. Um, the current Secretary of the Army, first woman Secretary of the Army, also a graduate of our school. Um, we've, we've done security policy and foreign policy very well for a long time. The biggest growth in our school today is uh, focusing on issues of policy surrounding uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we've added uh, no fewer than seven or eight classes um, since the murder of George Floyd. Um, the demand for these classes is off the charts. Uh, we've hired new professors to teach these classes. And the integration of our programming on policy regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is meeting up with students that are interested in foreign policy, security policy, education policy, uh, you name it. And I think that's our opportunity and our challenge today is to take the, the knowledge and the what I would even say is the wisdom of our students today at looking at uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion issues in a more central way in their lives and channeling that into all of these policy areas that they will go into. Thank you. Mary Tobin, you probably among <clears throat> all of us uh, work the closest with the people who were most affected after 9-11 on the battlefield and the families of those people. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you got into this? Uh, did 9-11 affect that all, at all? And what is the state of, I mean, it's a broad question, but of all the people that might be affected by what's just happened in Afghanistan, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, amazingly enough, I just left Quantico National Cemetery. Um, mm -hmm. I spent time with the Secretary of the VA this morning and survivors and family members of 9-11 um, 
did did uh, 9-11 Day of Service cleaning headstones and, and really mm. spending time with people who have served. Um, I will say this, for those of us um, who served in uniform and those of us who are also first responders and uh, deeply impacted on that day, when we get together, um, th- it is some very weird, traumatic kindred spirit mm-hmm. um, where we feel like um, family in, 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 in the worst and the best of ways. And what do I mean? Um, I, a few weeks ago, um, I was able to be involved in a PSA for 9-11 and it'll start to be aired uh, probably today and tomorrow. And I got to spend some time with uh, folks whose um, people whose sons and daughters had been killed um, as service members in Iraq and Afghanistan and those who were victims or, or survivors of 9-11. And many of them came up to me and said that they were sorry and they felt guilt over me going into war. And I said, what do you mean? They felt mm-hmm. as if the disabilities, the hurt and the loss that I experienced in Iraq and those of my brothers and sisters in Afghanistan was a result of me trying to defend the loss on 9-11. Mm-hmm. I had never, ever, ever heard that before. Um, it broke me down um, emotionally, but it also connected me um, to those folks. And these are people that frankly come from different parts of the world than I do. I, I, I probably would have prejudged them in all the wrong ways, um, but that tragic moment connected us. Why did I bring up those, that my service today and that service um, and that experience with the PSA? Um, well, one, because over the last couple of weeks, uh, service members and those who have lost their sons and daughters in war have wrestled with whether or not our service meant anything. Now, the interesting part about that is we don't choose whether or not we go to war. It is people like those on this call, those in Congress, um, those who have been public servants for years who decide whether or not um, folks like me serve. Um, what we are most concerned about for those of us in uniform is one, that we are defending a country worth serving. And for somebody like me, who was a black woman who has experienced racism in and out of the in and out of uniform, it's pretty interesting. Um, sometimes serving a country that you're not sure loves you back, um, and sometimes serving a country um, that makes it difficult for you to serve within the ranks. But not nevertheless, you serve with the hope that your country is always striving to be the America that it says is going to be. Um, the gentleman mentioned E Pluribus Unum, right? Um, I will say, I will say this, if nothing else, watching my brothers and sisters in arms cradle Afghanistan, Afghan babies, um, help mothers and fathers get out of the country. Um, I I have fellow veterans who work day and night getting interpreters and their families out of the country. It wasn't, it was less, and it was less paternal and it was more you saved my life and I'm going to save yours back. Um, those images weren't just for AP. We meant it. Um, those are our brothers and sisters in arms because they were fighting for a better country, just like we're fighting for a better country. So I said all of that to say, um, right now we struggle more with what does this mean? Was it in vain? Um, And I can say, standing there this morning, cleaning headstones with folks who lost everything on 9-11 and kneeling beside people, veterans who have lost limbs in service to this country, no, it wasn't in vain. Because if we save one life, if we help one person, then it means something. It has to mean something. Um, It has to mean that we're striving for something better than who we are right now. And I think that's what I I hang my hat on. So, you know, whereas I went to West Point because I came from a poor neighborhood in Southwest Atlanta and I got the opportunity of a lifetime to go to the premier leadership institution in the world and wind up being in war. um, What I I have become is a public servant, um, a servant of this country and a person who loves this country, whether it loves me back. So I'll, I'll just pause there. I wanted to ask you to follow up 
uh, with the students in mind, most of whom did not serve in uh, and are not even young, old enough to have served in civilian jobs either. Uh, how can students get involved? Um, you know, and and just be aware more of what actually went on. I'm I'm constantly surprised about the number of young people who weren't even really aware we were still in Afghanistan. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm proud to serve in a, in a federal agency called AmeriCorps. It is the only federal agency devoted to volunteerism and national service. So we're the good guys. We're the do-gooders, <laughs> um, which is which is what I love. Um, and I know so many young people, I'm talking about 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, who have done year one year service terms, six month service terms, three month service terms. Um, and what does that look like? That means anything from responding to disasters um, like Hurricane Ida. That means serving in communities to solve or address poverty. That means fighting wildfires. Um, we have over 200,000 members and volunteers who serve in AmeriCorps every single year who just decide, you know what? I'm gonna stop talking about the problems and I'm gonna work to solve them. So I would say, one, check us out, AmeriCorps. Um, because what I like to what I like to do as a veteran is teach people you don't have to be in uniform to serve this country. Um, so I would say get involved um, in AmeriCorps even this weekend for the 9/11 Day of Service. Um, through 65 cities across this country, people are serving right now. Um, we'll be food we'll be addressing food insecurity and COVID vaccinations over the next couple of days. You can get involved and do something right now. So. Um, uh, students, if you're listening, I know some folks like to take a gap year. There's a bunch of folks who took gap years, but you don't have to do that. You can go to AmeriCorps mm. right now and get involved and, and be a part of this, the solution. And you can meet people like me. I'll tell you the story of 11, <laughs> how it impacted us and how you can be a part of the solution moving forward. All right. Well, I can see why they put you on a PSA. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> call to action. <laughs> Thank you. So Dean Lucy, you're in the eye of the storm. You know, you uh, public health was such a big issue right after 9-11 at ground zero, and now we have the epidemic. Um, you know, 9-11, your first responderness, uh, did that guide you to where you are today or how did it, how did it change you? And how's your school, um, you know, adapting to, to the fact that we're a smaller world now? We're, not a, we're all much more connected than we used to be. Yeah, I mean, profound changes. Uh, it's a great question, Dana. And, and, and part of it is back to sort of that personal level. It, it was a complete game changer for me. I think Mary had talked about her perspectives being at West Point and how the rest of her life really unfolded. If, if there is a crux sort of scenario in, in my career path, it really was the events that occurred 20 years ago yesterday, right? And part of it was, you know, I was kind of on a pathway. I was an epidemiologist working on the like, occupational environmental issues, uh, occasionally responding to natural disasters. So you had that taste of, of crisis, uh, was deployed to the Kosovo war, pre-war scenario with internally displaced Kosovars and seeing war uh, have its public health impact. But afterwards, almost, you know, it was a one-two punch, let's remember, right? Because the, the, the first punch was all the events at, at, that occurred on September 11th. Within a month, we had the anthrax attacks going on, right? And we sometimes forget that that's the 20th anniversary of that as well, which also was life-changing because all of a sudden, in the midst of that vulnerability, we realized, oh my God, you know, are we really safe anywhere anymore? Public health obviously played a key role in both those events, right? Specifically at the World Trade Center, where ultimately it became quite apparent in those first few days that I was and my our teams were on site that no one survived. I mean, those first few days were very painful in that intermittently sirens would go off. And the sirens meant what? Everybody stand down, stand still. There was an eerie quietness uh, at, at, at the World Trade Center site because what we were still looking for people and the you know the urban search and rescue teams maybe heard something and there was complete silence and then the siren would go off again meaning there's nothing there let's continue working and then the rumbles would continue of construction equipment and all that mm -hmm. but but that was the on-site scenario 
behind the scene was what? Ultimately, this unfolded to be what? An incredible occupational health and environmental health issue. When we realized there was no one to save on site, it then became an issue that continues to this day, right? The repercussions of the environmental exposures, occupational exposures at that site caused untold issues over the last 20 years. But then the anthrax also attacks uh, changed this as well from the perspective of all of a sudden now we're into this response mode from a public health perspective. Now our school was informed until six years after the event. But I'll tell you, public health was changed from a, uh, for both from a positive and negative aspect. Yes, the response mode, the crisis mode uh, was important to teach. But at the same time, we realized the vulnerability of us as a society to always think that things are only important when there's a crisis going on, right? The reality is from a public health perspective, I have crises every day, right? Whether it's hypertension in a underserved community, whether it's the issue of diabetes rampant through our society, again, the issues of health disparities, health equity, racism as a public health issue, violence, gun violence as a public health issue. Let's remember people that this goes on each and every day. And yet each and every day, it rarely makes the headline news, right? Yes, it's all about COVID right now. But what I call the syndemics of the last year and a half, political strife, right? Racism, violence, climate change, all those aspects have their public health implications. And in fact, public health works with so many partners, right? I'm not saying we're lead on everything, but Bob Orr knows the importance of public health working with policy, right? The importance of us working with journalism, the importance of us working, yes, in the bigger medical community. All that stemmed from a realization of what happened 20 years ago tomorrow morning. Right, because at that point we got riled up and we got riled up to try to force ourselves to get better. Now, I remember returning from the 9-11 site, right? And, and coming back to two children at home. Many of them are now the, you know, are, or they were the age of, of many of our students right now. They were two and four. And I remember hugging them and thinking what? Thinking OMG, their lives are changed even though they don't remember necessarily the event, even though their lives have changed as a result of this. And what we have to basically still work on is, was that any aspect of a positive change to our world or not? I'd like to say the service component is important in all this. And I'll sort of end with that idea, right? Uh, for a while there, when I was in the office of the Surgeon General, I was doing lots of commencement speeches. I love this quote because in essence, it really does stem from what positive we learned as a result of the tragic events of yesterday. And it's Tagore, right, who basically said, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. So let's look at that as being part of the wave that needs to continue. Thank you. Okay. Well, I have a follow-up and it's really, when you look at all the things you, that you just now mentioned, all the issues, diabetes and hypertension, and how do you, um, how do you make sure your students don't, don't fall into a depression? How do you make sure that they stay healthy and, and uh, of sound mind? It's, it's, it's a great question to, to, to ask and sometimes difficult to, to sort of implement, right? If you're really dealing with all these issues, let me reflect again, 20 years ago, right? Our CDC team there from the National Institute for Occupational Safety Health, what did we become during those weeks that we were stationed there under those very stressful circumstances? Guess what? We became huggers, right? <laughs> At the end of every shift, you would hug the people taking over for you, right? We knew what was going on, right? We also acknowledged the word love in our life right? Maybe for the first time we got riled up, which is, you know, I turned to my fellow officers at the time and I said, I love what you're doing. I love your commitment to mission. I love that you're a volunteer here, right? Later on, when I commanded our hospital in Liberia in the midst of the Ebola crisis, I said those same words because we also had volunteers doing incredible work at the time. As per our students right now, I always tell our students, right? You know, the more I can get the word out there, I go, Guess what? Public health, because of exactly those uh, challenges that you mentioned, 
you have to be an optimist to enter the world of public health. If you are a pessimist, you will wash out, right? You will mm -hmm. wash out because the optimism means what? The optimism means that those challenges are taken on and we're looking for positive change in the world. Going back to something that Bob Orr is involved with and the whole university is involved with, we're a do-good profession in public health. And if I can convince our students that part of learning from bad events, including the COVID-19 pandemic, including the syndemics, including 9-11, is it's not enough to sit and lament, right? This is where service plays a role. This is where you begin changing the world for the better. And if, you know, and if you're not optimistic, then it's going to be a difficult undertaking. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to do what they call a lightning round now because we only have six minutes left. And I want to start with Georgina, but can you uh, just offer students one piece of advice for, uh, for getting involved, for, for serving, and going back to what uh, uh, what Bruce was just saying, how service can uh, be an antidote to all the bad things in, in, in the world. So what would your one piece of advice be to students uh, on this subject? I really appreciate what Dean Lushniak said and really want to emphasize the fact that service provides an opportunity for unity. But at the same time, I just have to acknowledge that even as we strive for unity, we do have a long way to go. And I'm just gonna point back way past the events of 9-11. I mean, back in 1852, Frederick Douglass delivered a speech that was titled, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? And I think that title sort of summarizes it all, but a couple of quick lines from that speech is the rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought, brought stripes and death to me. The 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. And a similar sentiment was repeated in 1903 by W.E.B. Du Bois, who talked about the two-ness of being an, Af uh, being an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideas in one body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. And so specifically to our black students who exist within this space of two-ness, I tell them to be strong, to be strong. It's been required of us from day one. It's exhausting, it is traumatizing, and I think that needs to be recognized and appreciated by all of us. Thank you. Imam Shreem, what would your advice to students be? Um, well, uh, first echoing uh, Georgina and, and Boris's comments, uh, definitely there's a tremendous need for us to step out of our comfort zone. And I, so I'll tell students, um, that there's no doubt there's a choice to make in our lives. Uh, you could look at the pictures being very gloomy and, and succumb to despair and, or complain as I always say, say in, at an individual level about the splinter, right? We experience that splinter in our lives and we can just focus on the splinter, the ache and obsess over that. Or we can say that there is a lot more than the splinter. There's me, there's my spirit, there's my soul, there's my heart, there's there's an opportunity for transformation. So I, what I remind students is that service is not just about, you know, it's, it's just kind of giving and sacrificing. It's an opportunity for tremendous growth and healing. If we have, I remind every student that they're worthy, each of them and every one of us is unique. We, we have to have the courage and the strength to affirm our stories and identities. Uh, we need to be afforded that space for affirming that. We need to be seen we need to see others. We need to humanize ourselves and humanize others. And if we're not able to acknowledge that ignorance and step out of our comfort zone, we're not gonna grow. But that if you look deep inside the temperaments, the tools, the soul that is sitting underneath that hard shell that Robert spoke about, that we've been hardened, and the ego stands in the way to separate us, but that underneath it all is a soul that wants to give, wants to love, wants to you know, see, wants to humanize and wants to be seen and, and validated 
and humanize, but that if we start to see ourselves as a warehouse of seeds, and seeds have the potential, if you plant the seed in the right soil, and we all need that soil, and we need to be a soil for others, because they're not going to grow their seeds, so we need to be the soil for them, it means that we need to hug them, right, not just physically, but also in terms of stance, it's stance, vigorous stance for their rights, to be a voice for the voiceless, to be defending those who cannot defend themselves in the marginalized communities, for Af African American brothers and sisters, for anybody who's been harmed or discriminated against. We need to be the soul for them so that they can be seen and grow. I would say that service is ultimately about looking at that capacity within to bring out of ourselves what is most beautiful, what is most life affirming, and that if we do, that we're going to grow, we're going to heal, we're going to find that fulfillment and joy that is that is that transcends every other sensation of pleasure in our lives. And we're going to find purpose, but it also hinges on that, that tendency towards truth, towards genuine, authentic compassion. Every one of us, of us is capable of it. I remind students that if they don't step out of their comfort zone and act on that, they're not going to grow, they're not going to heal. So that's my message to them. And also, I, I'll be honest with you, to myself, to my community, we did a lot of solidarity and being real with each other. So, you know, I pray for that. I really pray for everybody here because honestly, I'm so grateful to be in the company of these beautiful souls around us right here in this conversation. I yearn for more conversations like this because we need the space and the time for it. But thanks to all. Thanks to all. And I, I really pray for you, for you from the bottom of my heart because you're leading the way and you inspire all of us by what you're doing. Thank you. Dean Orr, how, what would you say to students who already feel overwhelmed just trying to get through their day and do their schoolwork and maybe they have a job as well? How, how would they fit service into their lives and why should, they, why should they even try? It's those who are most busy uh, doing their schoolwork and making ends meet and helping their families that most need the service. Service gives back, uh, it feeds you, um, it, it, you have to fit it in. Um, Mary's words are ringing in my head about the country that didn't always love her back. Our students are the ones who can and must make America better, that America's promise has to be realized. And so this, this call to service is about invest yourself in making this country better. Make us that, that more uh, inclusive, that, that more loving uh, country again, that non-hardened country. And I, I think that's, that, that feeds the students right back when you can actually see that you're making a difference on it. Um, I, I, would, I would say that the spirit of this conversation today is exactly what our students are craving. Uh, they want to know that there are opportunities for service, that it will make a difference, and that what they care about is also what those of us in positions of authority also care about, and that we need them to, to lead the way on this. Thank you. Mary Tobin again. I wanted to ask you, I really want to stay on the issue of veterans and military service because so many uh, students in particular don't have anybody in their family that served, don't know anybody who's in the military. And uh, how important do you think it is uh, for, for students like that to familiarize their, themselves some way with um, people in the military or military history or, or anything that, that, anything military that they are maybe not only not familiar with, but a little intimidated about. Yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think it's very important. One, because uh, the military does not act of its own will and accord. Uh, we act in concert with our civilian counterparts. We have civilian oversight. Ultimately, it is civilians that send us into war. So if it is you all who are not in uniform, who are making those decisions, whether or not I live or die in service of this country, I need for you to understand. I need for you to know the history. I need for you to know um, our capabilities, peacekeeping, and as well as war fighting. 
um, I need for that there to be an understanding as well as an appreciation for, you know, even, you know, those of us who are minorities serving in the military, we experience many of the same disparities and inequities that um, our counterparts or minorities outside of uniform experience, but it is our civilian counterparts that can change that on our behalf. So if you've ever seen a case of racism or sexism or sexual assault in the military, you go, man, that's a darn shame. Well, guess who has the power to help control that and change that? It's those of you out of uniform. So we need I, need, I desperately need for those of you who are in this work, public health work, pu public policy, foreign policy, to understand um, the use of the military in the shaping of this country. Absolutely. Um, you know, I would secondarily, I, I have benefited so much from listening to all of you all. Um, I don't get to sit in a room full of very smart people, academics all the time, <laughs> and just listen to you all um, pontificate and articulate um, <laughs> things that make me feel uncomfortable a little bit, but um, challenge the way I think about my service and what I even do now. And I would say to, uh, to the students listening, you don't have to serve um, in uniform to be a part of this uh, great machine and this experiment called America. Um, as a matter of fact, um, to the Imam, in my faith set, there's a scripture that says, uh, one man plants, another man waters, but the creator gets the increase. Um, in, in, in each of those stages, that was service. There was a white man who put who planted the seed in my life to go to West Point. My mother was um, another person who planted seeds of beauty and um, persistence um, in spaces and places where I was told I would never be anything or make it out of the ghetto. Um, and then there were just soldiers who told me I could be a good leader over and over and over again. And there's people who believed in me when I didn't believe in myself and I wanted to give up. So if even if you are working hard, you, you can't carry your, your workload, your class load, you got that extra job, and you got so many responsibilities, even if you just speak positivity and life into somebody today, that service. Now, then it'll come, uh, it'll come. The opportunity to turn pain into purpose uh, will come. And when it comes, I need for you to answer that call. So no pressure on you. Believe me, you'll know when it comes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Dean Lusniak, can you, can you offer uh, a piece of advice for students who feel, um, you know, overwhelmed, especially mentally right now, because we do talk about that a lot with COVID and isolation. What would you suggest? Well, you know, nothing works unless you take care of yourself, uh, you know, and, and we've been stressing this with our own students at the School of Public Health and throughout the university, which is in the midst of, let's just begin at, at, with the current state of affairs, in the midst of all the stressors that everybody's been, been undergoing, as I mentioned, the syndemics, the pan, infectious disease pandemic, even, you know, the tragic news from Afghanistan and the withdrawal and, and the repercussions of all that is that, you know, at the same time, one is, you know, uh, and I'll put it out there, my, my students oftentimes, you know, hear this a million times, but let's remember what health is, right? And the definition of health as put out by the World Health Organization is what? It's complete, that's a key adjective, complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So point number one is take care of yourselves, right? Uh, and this becomes a mental health issue, a physical health issue, and yes, a social health issue. So I think that's point number one, is you will not function as a student, nor will you function as a productive member of our society unless you make that first and foremost in your life. Is it a little bit of selfishness? Yes, it is. But ultimately, it's for the good of society. Healthy people are functional people. Then influence those around you, your friends, your family, your loved ones, right? Make sure that they also are taking care of them, uh, themselves, right? We have a health and wellness initiative at the School of Public Health where we've been trying to prime this not only for our faculty, staff, but students, the whole community out there. Next aspect is be aware of what's going on. I don't want you to overanalyze the world around you, but I keep emphasizing to everyone, faculty, staff, and students at the School of Public Health is, we've been through an incredible crisis in the last year and a half, right? Don't ignore it, 
but learn something from it, right? Determine, what did I learn about myself? What did I learn about my family, about the loved ones around? What did I learn about my community, my country, and the globe, right? Make it cerebral so that you walk away with a lesson learned. What's weird about 9-11 is that to, to our current students, 9-11 is like, let's be honest, it's like Pearl Harbor was to me. I read about it in books and I right. really didn't give a damn, right? I knew it had repercussions, but it was somebody else's. Well, I and many of us on this panel have repercussions from 9-11. I'm not telling to the students, oh, feel the same way about 9-11 that I do. But guess what? Maybe this last year and a half is your change of life, right? Maybe this is the events of the pandemic and the syndemics is what gets your generation going. Learn from it. The last thing for our students is, guess what? Part of the negatives of 9-11 of was what? There was hatred 20 years ago yesterday or tomorrow. There was hatred in terms of response. Hatred is easy. Hatred is easy. It's a very guttural, almost an animalistic reaction. Emphasize the love component, right? How do we make the world a better place? Uh, and, and, and that's the difficult component, but I would love our students to think about that. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Well, I want to wrap up uh, and loop us back to 9-11 where we started and just remind everybody uh, who's listening that there is so much you can do that is still directly related to 9-11. And we see that with the Afghan refugee issue. And there are so many ways to get involved. Uh, I was just looking at the Washington Post's uh, many um, you know, donation places, but also uh, people who can do things like drive refugees from the airport to a new home, uh, donate uh, time and donate things that you don't need anymore. There's just so many things. And I, and if anyone on this panel wants to uh, either write in the chat uh, or we could send out something later or knows right now of something that the university is organizing <clears throat> that helps connect students and faculty to the needs of Afghan refugees, um, you know, let me know now or let us know now. Does anybody out there know uh, whether there is something for students to connect to on that issue before we leave? If not, we can uh, put it in the chat and so we can uh, have students refer to it later. But I really want to thank everybody. I thought it was particularly strong that you're all emphasizing, emphasizing service as a way to not only help the world, but help, help ourselves. And so with that, I want to close and um, thank the sponsors of this event and urge the students out there to get involved and to, as, uh, as Dean Lushniak said, take care of yourself as well. And that's, in that way, you'll be able to take care of the world. Thank you. <laughs>